introduction to the prose edda the prose edda by snorri sturluson translated by arthur gilchrist brodur eighteen eighty eight to nineteen seventy one translator's introduction the life of snorri sturluson fell in a great but contradictory age when all that was noble and spiritual in men seemed to promise social regeneration and when bloody crimes and sordid ambitions gave this hope the lie not less than the rest of europe scandinavia shared in the bitter conflict between the law of the spirit and the law of the members the north like england and the continent felt the religious fervour of the crusades passed from potential anarchy into union and national consciousness experienced a literary and spiritual revival and suffered the fury of persecution and of fratricidal war no greater error could be committed than to think of the northern lands as cut off by barriers of distance tongue and custom from the heart of the continent and in consequence as countries where men's thoughts and deeds were more unrestrained and uncivilized even as england france and germany acted and reacted upon one another in politics in social growth in art and in literature so all three acted upon scandinavia and felt the reaction of her influence nearly thirty years before snorri's birth the danish kingdom had been the plaything of a german prince henry the lion who set up or pulled down her rulers as he saw fit and during snorri's boyhood one of these rulers valdemar i contributed to henry's political destruction in norway sverir sigurdarson had swept away the old social order and replaced it with one more highly centralized had challenged the power of rome without and that of his own nobles within like henry the second of england and frederick barbarossa after sverir's death an interregnum followed but at last there came to the throne a monarch both powerful and enlightened who extended the reforms of sverir and having brought about unity and power quickened the intellectual life of norway with the fructifying influence of french and english literary models under the patronage of this ruler hakon hakonarsson the great romances notably those of chretien de Troyes, were translated into norse some of them passing over into swedish danish and icelandic somewhat later matthew paris the great scholar and author who represented the culture both of england and of france spent eighteen months in norway though not until after snorri's death iceland itself in part through norway in part directly drew from the life of the continent simunder the learned who had studied in paris founded a school at odi sturla sigvatsson snorri's nephew made a pilgrimage to rome and visited germany and snorri himself shows in the opening pages of his heimskringla or history of the kings of norway the influence of that great romantic cycle the matter of troy snorri sturluson was in the fullest sense a product of his time the son of a turbulent and ambitious chieftain sturla Tordsson of fam in western iceland he was born to a heritage of strice and avarice the history of the sturlung house like that of douglas in scotland is a long and perplexed chronicle of intrigue treachery and assassination in all of which snorri played an active part but even as among the douglases there was one who however deep in treason and intrigue yet loved learning and poetry and was distinguished in each so snorri involved by sordid political chicanery found time not only to compose original verse which was admired by his contemporaries but also to record the myths and legends the history and poetry of his race in a prose that is one of the glories of the age the perplexing story of snorri's life told by his nephew sturla tordsson may well be omitted from this brief discussion a careful and scholarly account of it by eriker magnusson will be found in the introduction to the sixth volume of the saga library from snorri's marriage in eleven ninety nine to his assassination at the hands of his son-in-law gizur torvaldsson in twelve forty one there was little in his life which his biographer could relate with satisfaction his friends his relatives his very children snorri sacrificed to his insatiate ambition 
as chief and as lawman he gave venal decisions and perverted justice he purposed at any cost to become the most powerful man in iceland there is even ground for belief that he deliberately undertook to betray the republic to hakon of norway and that only his lack of courage prevented him from subverting his country's liberty failure brought about his death for snorri who had been a favourite at the norwegian court incurred the king's suspicion after fifteen years had passed with no accomplishment and daring to leave norway against hakon's command he fell under the royal displeasure gizur his murderer proved to have been acting at the express order of the king eriker magnusson in the admirable biography to which i have referred attempts to apologize for snorri's faults on the ground that he really compares very favourably with the leading contemporary godar or chieftains of the land it is true that he made no overt attempt to keep his treacherable promise to norway but i think it is by no means certain that repentance stayed his hand indeed familiar as he was with the hopelessly anarchical conditions of his native land its devastating feuds its plethora of lawless unscrupulous chiefs all striving for wealth and influence none inspired with a genuine affection for the commonwealth nor understanding the fundamental principles of democracy snorri may well have felt that it were far better to endure a foreign ruler who could compel union and peace if this was the motive underlying his self-abasement at the norwegian court and his promises to hakon then weakness alone is sufficient to account for his failure if he had no such purpose he must be regarded as both weak and treacherous it is with relief that we turn to snorri's works to find in them at least traces of genuine nobility of spirit the unscrupulous politician kept sound and pure some corner of his heart in which to enshrine his love for his people's glorious past for the myths of their ancient gods half grotesque and half sublime for the christ-like boulder for promethean odin and tyr sacrificing eye and hand to save the race for the tears of freya the tragic sorrows of gudrun the pitiful end of svanhildr the magnificent all devastating fire of ragnarok his interest in these wondrous things like scott's love for the heroes beliefs and customs of the scottish folk was i think primarily antiquarian indefatigable in research with an artist's eye for the picturesque a poet's feeling for the dramatic and the human he created the most vivid vital histories that have yet been penned accurate beyond the manner of his age gifted with genius for expression divining the human personalities the comic or tragic interplay of ambitions passions and destinies behind the mere chronicled events he had almost ideal qualities as an historian poet he was too though the codified rules the cryptic phrase and conventional expression which indeed bound together the words of the singers of ancient scandinavia must spoil his verse for us yet it is well to remember that in his own lifetime not his natural prose but his artificial poetry was famous throughout the north snorri's greatest work is undoubtedly the heimskringla beginning with a rationalized account of the founding of northern civilization by the ancient gods he proceeds through heroic legend to the historical period and follows the careers of his heroes on the throne in eastern courts and camps or on forays in distant lands from the earliest times to the reign of sverir who came to the throne in eleven eighty four five years after the author's birth the materials at snorri's disposal says magnusson were oral tradition written genealogical records old songs or narrative lays such as tildos tale of the inglings and avin's haloga tale poems of court poets that is historic songs which people knew by heart all from the days of herfair down to snorri's own time and most store he says we set by that which is said in such songs as were sung before the chiefs themselves or the sons of them and we hold all that true which is found in these songs concerning their wayfarings and their battles of the written prose sources he drew upon he only mentions ari the learned's book probably as it seems to us because in the statements of that work he had as implicit a faith 
as in the other sources he mentions and found reason to alter nothing therein while the sources he does not mention he silently criticises throughout rejecting or altering them according as his critical faculty dictated before snorri's time there existed only separate disjointed biographical monographs on norwegian kings written on the model of the family sagas of iceland snorri's was a more ambitious task discerning that the course of life is determined by cause and effect and that in the lives of kings widely ramified interests national and dynastic came into play he conceived a new idea of saga writing the seed of cause sown in the preceding must yield its crop of effect in the succeeding reign this the writer of lives of kings must bear in mind and so snorri addresses himself to writing the first pragmatic history ever penned in any teutonic vernacular the heimskringla the evidence for snorri's authorship of heimskringla is not conclusive but figfusson's demonstration is accepted by most scholars we may safely assume apart from the general tendency of the external evidence that one and the same author must have written the histories and the prose edda a comparison of the names of skalds and skaldic poems mentioned in both works will show that the author of each had a wide acquaintance with the conventional poetic literature of scandinavia particularly of iceland and that if we suppose two distinct authors both men had almost precisely the same poetic equipment each of the works under consideration begins with a rationalization of the odinic myths and reveals an identity of attitude toward the ancient faith furthermore the careful reader will be charmed with the sinewy style of both the heimskringla and the edda and will be obliged to admit the close similarity between them in structure and in expression finally vigfusson has shown that they exhibit occasionally a remarkable identity of phrase the prose edda is undoubtedly by snorri it is preserved in three primary manuscripts codex regius early fourteenth century codex wormianus fourteenth century named from ole vorm from whose hands it passed in seventeen o six into the hands of arni magnusson and codex upsaliensis about thirteen hundred perhaps a direct copy of snorri's own text this last manuscript and also the arna magnaean vellum number seven forty eight which preserves a portion of the text testify unmistakably to snorri's authorship the codex even gives in detail the subjects of the three divisions of the book these three divisions but for the evidence of the manuscripts might seem to afford ground for assuming plural authorship the first part the gilfagining or beguiling of gilfi is an epitome of odinic mythology cast in the form of a dialogue between gilfi a legendary swedish king and the triune odin snorri though a christian tells the old pagan tales with obvious relish and often in the enthusiasm of the true antiquary rises to magnificent heights ever and again he fortifies his narrative with citations from the poetic edda the great treasure house of scandinavian mythological and heroic poetry one passes from gilfagening to skalds kaparmal with very little shock in spite of the great difference in subject and treatment which the author has attempted rather skilfully to modulate through a second dialogue the questioner this time is one Egir, and replies are made by the god bragi famed for eloquence and the gift of poetic expression this intermediate dialogue called braga Redur, or bragi's discourses strikes the keynote of the entire book and really reconciles the first section to the second and third whose dissimilarity to gilfagining had led some scholars to believe that one or the other is not snorri's work the god relates several adventures of the aesir of the same character as those recounted in gilfagining and concludes with a myth concerning the origin of the poetic art from this point on barely maintaining the fiction of the dialogue snorri makes his work a treatise on the conventional vocabulary and phraseology of skaldship for the guidance of young skalds the third section of the edda is the hatatal or enumeration of meters and combines three separate songs of praise one on king hakon a second on skuli bardson the king's father-in-law and most powerful vassal 
and a third celebrating both. Each of the hundred and two stanzas of the work belongs to a distinct metric type or subtype, and between stanzas Snorri has inserted definitions, occasionally longer notes or comments. We are now in a position to see the purpose and the artistic unity of the prose Edda. The entire work is a textbook for apprentice poets. Gilfagening, conceived in the true antiquarian spirit, supplies the mythological and legendary background which in the christian age that had superseded the vivid old heathen days a young man might not know or might avoid do not lose sight of these splendid tales of the fathers snorri by implication says to the youthful bard but remember always that these old legends are to be used to point a moral or adorn a tale and not to be believed or to be altered without authority of ancient skalds who knew them belief is sin tampering with tradition is a crime against scholarship the second and third sections skalds kaprama and hatatal offer the rules of composition and drive them home by means of models drawn in the one case from acknowledged masters of the craft in the other by the example of a complete skaldic trilogy the work of a man who was accepted by his own time as a worthy successor of bragi Kormaker and einar a needed transition from the literary to the technical portion of the book is supplied by bragaridur which narrates in the same spirit as gilfagening further useful tales and concludes with a mythological account of the skaldic art even the prologue which many scholars consider spurious is an integral part of the work a fact established by snorri's single address in the character of the author to beginners in this apostrophe he refers to the prologue remember these tales are to be used only as chief skulls have used them and must be revered as ancient tradition but are neither to be believed nor to be tampered with regard them as i have indicated at the beginning of this book the beginning of the book is a summary of the biblical story of the creation and deluge followed by a rationalized account of the rise of the ancient pagan faith according to which the old gods appear not as deities but as men the word edda as applied to the whole work has long furnished scholars with material for disputation the different theories regarding it need not be restated here it is the translator's personal opinion that magnusson's etymology if not established is at least the most satisfactory one likely to be offered Magnusson points out that Snorri passed the interval between his third and nineteenth years at Odi, under the fostering of the grandson of Simundur the Learned. That Simundur, who had studied at Paris, had founded a school at Odi, that Snorri became the author of a book which was called Edda, and that this book contains in its first section a prose paraphrase of many of the songs from the elder or poetic Edda, together with a number of quotations from that work now the poetic edda was ascribed by its earliest recorded possessor bishop brynjolf svensson to simondur and while it is improbable that simondur composed the poem it is highly probable that it once formed part of his library at odi there snorri may have learned to know it and we may assume that he gave the prose edition the name of its poetical original that original the mother manuscript he thinks would naturally have been called the book of or at odi which would be expressed in icelandic either as odabok or as edda following in the latter case accepted linguistic laws snorri's familiarity with the elder or poetic edda is demonstrated by his frequent quotations from voluspa havamal grimnismal bathrudnismal alvinsmal or alvismal and grotansungr he knew Lokasena as well, but confused three stanzas, apparently failing to remember the order in his original. One poem that he mentions is lacking in the poetic Edda as we know it. Heimdallr Galdr, the song or incantation of Heimdallr. Moreover, he makes seventeen citations from other poems, which, although lost to us, evidently form portions of the original Eddic collections or belong to the same traditional stock the disappearance of the manuscript which snorri used is a great loss the first translation of the prose edda was published at copenhagen in sixteen sixty five when the complete text appeared 
with latin and danish interpretations this was entitled edda islandorum an chronicum 1215 islandice conscripta persnoronem sturlai nunc primum islandice danice et latine ex antiquis codicibus in lucem prodit opera p j resengi the standard danish translation is that of r nierup copenhagen eighteen sixty five in seventeen forty six j gurenson printed at upsala the first swedish version with a latin translation gurenson's original was the codex upsaliensis anders upstrom made an independent translation in eighteen fifty nine in seventeen fifty five and fifty six there appeared at copenhagen a work of the greatest importance for the study of scandinavian antiquities in england Malais, monument de la mythologie et de la poésie des celtes et particulièrement de anciens scandinaves this book which comprised the general introduction on the ancient scandinavian civilization a translation of gilfagening and a synopsis of skalds kaparmal and hatatal was turned into english by bishop percy under the title of northern antiquities percy claimed to know gurenson's text as well as the french northern antiquities was published at london in seventeen seventy and was reprinted at edinburgh in eighteen o nine with editions by sir walter scott the best-known translation and the only complete one which is at all trustworthy is that in latin combined with the icelandic text in the arnamagnean edition copenhagen eighteen forty eight to eighty seven in eighteen forty two g w dasent the translator of njal's saga and a prominent scholar in the scandinavian field printed at stockholm his prose or younger edda which contains a translation of gilfagening and of the narrative passages of skalds kaparmal a similarly incomplete english version was printed at chicago in eighteen eighty by rasmus b anderson professor anderson also edited a combined translation of both eddas the poetic edda by benjamin thorpe and the prose edda by i a blackwell blackwell's translation which stops with bragaredur had first appeared at london in eighteen forty seven together with an abstract of erbigya saga by scott samuel lang's translation is likewise incomplete a french version of gilfagening la fascination de gulfi was published at strasbourg by f g bergman a second edition appeared in eighteen seventy one so far as i can ascertain the first translation into german was the work of friedrich ruse berlin eighteen twelve this contains a long historical introduction and ends with the story of the Wulsungs in skalds kaparmal karl zimrock's die jüngere edda published in eighteen fifty one and reprinted in eighteen fifty five although incomplete is more accurate than any earlier translation and is remarkable for its literary excellence the most scholarly rendering into german is by hugo gering leipzig eighteen ninety two but unfortunately includes only the narrative portions of the book until nineteen hundred the best edition of snorri's edda was by torleifer jonsson copenhagen eighteen seventy five this was superseded by finur jonsson's splendid danish edition in nineteen o seven professor jonsson produced an icelandic edition which forms volume forty one of the islandinga zuger published at reykjavik it was fortunate for me that these last two editions appeared before i began my work professor jonsson provided me with an excellent text and second in value only to this with an index and an invaluable icelandic prose rephrasing of the skaldic verses i regret exceedingly that the highly technical nature of hatatal forbids translation into english there are to be sure more or less usually less accurate translations into scandinavian and into latin even in the excellent arnamagnean edition many of the glosses are purely conjectural and any attempt to convey into english a vocabulary which has no equivalent in our language must fail skalds kaparma however is here presented complete for the first time in english to those who have helped me i wish to express my deepest appreciation first of all to professor william henry schofield i owe a debt of gratitude 
which is more than four years old and has increased beyond computation dr henry goddard leach my first instructor in scandinavian literature gave me my single greatest intellectual stimulus and thereby determined the current of my work dr frederick w leader of harvard university deserves my thanks for his devoted assistance in reading proof a task as dreary as it is essential i am also indebted for valuable suggestions to mr h w rabe of simmons college it is a great satisfaction to acknowledge these debts incurred in the course of a labour which has been my delight for several years i should however do injustice to those who have aided me as well as to myself if i did not assume full responsibility for the faults of the translation whatever these may be i trust that the book may perform some service in bringing before the english reading public a greater portion of snorri's classic treatise than has previously been accessible the reader will perceive the value of the edda if he will compare it for legendary and antiquarian interest with the mabinogion and will also realize that the edda is a masterpiece of style style that no translator can ever reproduce a g b cambridge massachusetts july first nineteen sixteen end of introduction recording by expatriate in bangor maine